I want to talk to you today about two of the most basic paradoxes of deontic logic. The robber and victim paradoxes, they're very similar. They were proposed by different people at slightly different times, but they came up early in the history of deontic logic. What is deontic logic? It's the logic of obligation, permission, forbiddance. It is the basic logic of our deontic concepts. It's built around modal logic. The idea is that obligation is in some way analogous to necessity. Permission, analogous to possibility, and so on. And the idea of that analogy and building this on modal logic actually goes all the way back to medieval times when people were quite aware that there was this kind of parallel between necessity and then having to do something for some normative, some ethical reason, or some practical reason, as opposed to outright necessity. And so it's a tradition that goes, in a certain sense, all the way back at least to the 14th century. But really, only in the 20th century did deontic logic become a field. Ernst Malley was the first person to really try to develop it in modern times in 1926. But the major work on it that advanced the field considerably was by von Richt in 1951. Shortly after that, the robber and victim paradoxes emerged. So what are they? Well, they're actually very simple, and they challenge the same principle of deontic logic, which I'll get to in a moment. Here's the robber paradox. Imagine that a robber has stolen something. You can say, now, first of all, you should not steal. But secondly, well, if the robber has stolen something, he should give back what he stole. So, what follows from that? Well, the robber, let's say, shouldn't have stolen, but did steal something. If the robber stole something, the robber should return what he stole. Well, it seems to follow the robber should return what he stole. Well, so far, so good. It doesn't seem as if there's anything paradoxical about this. Ah, but wait a minute. The robber should give back what he stole. Well, you can give back something you've stolen only if you've stolen something. So it looks like a logical necessity that you can return something you have stolen only if you have stolen something. But now, it's extremely plausible to think that if something is obligatory, then anything that follows logically from it is also obligatory. Let's call that closure under logical consequence. It's a very plausible sort of principle to apply to obligation, and it seems like something that actually it would be hard to avoid. After all, if I ought to, let's say I promised to meet some friends at Fonda San Miguel tonight for dinner, then I have an obligation to meet my friends tonight at Fonda San Miguel for dinner. So I have an obligation to meet someone for dinner at San Miguel. I have an obligation to meet someone for dinner, and so on. Those things follow logically. So if I have that stronger obligation, it seems like the things that are weaker than that, logically speaking, should also be obligatory. If I ought to meet my friends for dinner at Fonda San Miguel, then I ought to meet my friends for dinner. I ought to meet someone at Fonda San Miguel, and so on. Well, plausible or not, that's what gets us into trouble here. Because we've said that the robber has an obligation to give back what he stole. But it's a matter of logical necessity that you can give back something you've stolen only if you've stolen it. Consequently, it looks like the robber ought to have stolen it. But wait, we had agreed at the outset that the robber shouldn't have stolen anything. Ah, hence the paradox. The victim paradox is just turning this around. So let's say that someone has been a victim of a crime. Let's say this person is the one who's been robbed. Okay, well, they shouldn't have been robbed. It was wrong for anybody to rob them. But the victim was robbed. Now, you might think that it ought to be the case that if somebody's been robbed, they are compensated. Okay, maybe they're compensated by the robber who gets caught. Maybe they should be compensated by the insurance company. Maybe they should be compensated by some general fund. We don't have to worry about that. But at least they are owed something. They should be compensated. So this person shouldn't have been robbed, but they were. Well, if somebody's been robbed, they ought to be compensated. It seems to follow that they ought to be compensated for what was stolen from them. But now, as a matter of logical necessity, you can be compensated for something that was stolen from you only if something was stolen from 
And if you're worried that people might be compensated without actually deserving it, well, we can say, then properly compensated. Okay, compensated with just, justly compensated to get rid of that little problem. So they ought to be justly compensated. But you can be justly compensated only if you have suffered this loss. If someone has committed an injustice against you, let's say, so if someone should have committed an injustice against you, you should have been robbed. And again, we started out by assuming that's not true, that you shouldn't have been robbed. Once again, we get led into paradox. Well, the simplest thing to do here is to say there's something wrong with that principle of closure under logical consequence. Maybe it's simply not true that if the robber, for example, has an obligation to give back what they stole, they should have stolen something. Maybe it's not true that if you've suffered an injustice, then you should be compensated, but we don't want to say that. Ooh, that seems bad. We could deny, in other words, the substantive principle, but it seems much more plausible to say, no, it should go wrong here. You ought to be compensated justly for the loss you've suffered. So you should have suffered the loss? Something has gone wrong. But what's gone wrong? What exactly is wrong with that principle of closure under logical consequence? After all, it seemed pretty plausible in a lot of cases. If I have an obligation to meet my friends for dinner, I have an obligation to meet somebody for dinner. I have an obligation to meet my friends. I have an obligation to meet someone at San Miguel, if that's the nature of the promise. And so something has gone wrong. But how do we solve the problem? It's not an easy thing to decide. But before we contemplate that, I'm going to, in later videos, talk about other paradoxes of deontic logic that force us to rethink the logic of our basic moral concepts.